Welcome everyone to this fifth topical session in the virtual 2020 public symposium of US Japan Council on the topic of baseball diplomacy. I'm Yuko Kaifu and I'm the president of Japan House Los Angeles. And I'm also so pleased uh, to, um, to co-host this program with um, USJC. Um, and I'm also on the board of US Japan Council. For those of you who don't know who Japan House LA is, Japan House LA is a public diplomacy initiative launched by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan to showcase the best of Japan in wide ranging areas. We're located in the heart of Hollywood with a gallery, library, event hall, restaurant and retail spaces. Due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, our facilities have been temporarily closed now but we have been presenting many virtual and online programs, including today's exciting discussions. Uh, before we start the program, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, this session will be conducted in English, but Japanese interpretation is available by clicking on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. I now like to introduce to you our friend and USAC board member, Joshua Mori, president of the J. Mori Company, who helped organize this dialogue. Josh, take it over. Hi, everyone. I'm Joshua Mori, uh, as Yuko mentioned, president of the J. Mori Company, also owner of Yonisei Baseball USA and board member of the US Japan Council. I just wanna take this opportunity to thank our many sponsors and promotional partners for your support of the US Japan Council and this symposium. I would like to offer our sincere appreciation to our platinum sponsor, Fabit, and to our other platinum sponsor, the Ford Foundation. I would also like to thank our title sponsors, Central Pacific Bank Foundation, Hitachi, Itoen, Mitsui, MUFG Union Bank, the Terasaki Nibe Foundation, and Toyota Research Institute. I would also like to thank our signature sponsors. We are so grateful for your support in helping make programming like this possible. And to the many companies and individuals who make up our premier sponsors, we truly appreciate your generosity. We're proud of this fantastic group of supporters and couldn't be here without you. Finally, our gold sponsors can be seen on this slide. And we would like to once again, thank each and every one of you for your continued support, especially through this most challenging year. I would also like to thank our co-host, Japan House Los Angeles, for all their support and partnership on this session. So I don't know about you, but I'm extremely excited for this discussion because personally, baseball was my first love. I vividly remember my first Dodgers game, also standing in the mirror of my parents' bedroom, trying to replicate Hideo Nomo's pitching windup and sitting outside every day for my dad to get home to play catch. Fast forward 10 years to my senior year in college, my dad and mom flew out to Chicago for every one of my home games. I know it's just a game, but this simple game of baseball has been part of the glue that has bound my family together. And while I'm personally excited for this panel, I'm also especially intrigued to dive deeper into learning how the game of baseball has played and continues to play a role in diplomacy between the US and Japan. In many ways, just like in my family, it's part of the glue that binds us together. Now, before we get to our panel, I'd like to introduce our wonderful moderators, Yuriko Gamoromo and Rob Fitz. Yuriko Gamoromo is an award-winning director based in San Francisco. She holds a master's degree in documentary filmmaking from Stanford University and is a student Academy Award winner and National Academy of Television Arts and Science Scholar. Her current documentary project, Diamond Diplomacy, explores the relationship between the United States and Japan through a shared love of baseball. And Rob Fitz, our second moderator, is the primary historical research consultant for Diamond Diplomacy. Fitz left academics behind, former archaeologist at Brown University, to follow his passion, Japanese baseball. His articles have appeared in numerous magazines, including the Baseball Research Journal, the National Pastime, and on MLB.com. Fitz is the author of four books on Japanese baseball. His latest, Issei Baseball History, is a personal favorite, as well as, as his other works, Mashi, The Unfulfilled Baseball Dreams of Masanori Murakami, the first Japanese major leaguer, and Wally Yonamine, the man who changed Japanese baseball. Well, hello to everyone. Um, and first I wanna say thank you to US Japan Council, the Japan House of LA and to all our panelists. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce um, our panel. 
first Don Nomura, he was first a baseball player and then he became an agent. He was the agent who brought Hideo Nomo to Major League Baseball in 1995 and opened the doors for all the Japanese players now joining the major leagues. Then we have Jim Small, Major League Baseball's senior vice president of international, having spent the last 16 years of his life in Japan, is probably suffering some culture shock from being back in the United States right now. Then we have Dwayne Kurisu. Dwayne is the minority owner, is a minority owner of the San Francisco Giants and is also organizer and owner of Hawaii Winter Baseball, which is an off-season professional baseball league in Hawaii for minor league players and also um, young players from Japan and Korea. Then we have Matt Merton. Matt is our veteran professional baseball player, having played baseball in both countries. He played for the Red Sox, the Cubs, but most relevant for today's conversation, he played for the Hanshin Tigers. So let's begin this discussion. First, we'd like to have our panelists talk about thoughts and experiences of different cultural attitudes around baseball between Japan and the United States. So Matt, let's begin with you. What are the cultural differences that you've experienced as a player often on the baseball field? And how did that play out around your breaking of Ichiro's MPB record, including the expectations and the reality of your experience? Yes, first off, uh, thank you again to USJC uh, for the opportunity to be here as well as the Japan House Los Angeles. It's a privilege to be here with this panel. Um, in many ways, they shaped and formed and, and provided a, an avenue by which we as athletes were able to engage um, both from America to Japan and Japan to America. I think one of the things that most people will recognize when you make that journey is that the culture plays a big part in how well you ultimately succeed, how you embrace culture. And so for me, I know that one of the things that was impressed upon me before I went was you can never forget who you are um, and where you came from, but you better be willing to um, open your eyes and accept the culture you're going to. You better embrace it. And so that was kind of the way that I tried to um, take on uh, the journey to Japan with my family. And uh, culturally speaking, I think the first day of spring training will certainly provide all that you, all that you need to know for what's to come uh, in regards to the differences in how we approach the game here in America as compared to Japan. Uh, in Japan, it, it was very evident from a very early stage within uh, training camp that uh, repetition uh, was going to be paramount coming from the United States, I always had pride in how hard I would work. In fact, there were times where I had coaches that said I needed to slow down a little bit because I was going to fatigue myself. So I came to Japan with this feeling and this sense of like being prepared for what I was about to uh, embark on. And yet when I got there, I I'll never forget after hitting in the first cage on the field and then hitting off the machine in the middle and then hitting off the next uh, pitcher on the field. And then they said I needed to go into the uh, indoor facility and hit more curveballs off the machine. I was like, are you sure I have to do that? I feel like I've had enough at this point. But I had to find a way. I tried from the very beginning to be willing to, uh, to be a part, to be a part of the group, as I knew that that would be important. Um, I do think that by embracing the culture and by trying to be a part of the group, I do think that it, it provided the opportunity as an athlete um, to settle in a little bit. I was able to get off to a good start. And as you mentioned, I was very fortunate in my first year. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the team that I played on. We had a great offense that year. It was the year that Kenji Jojima had come back from the United States to the Tigers. Um, he was a huge part of my success and how he embraced me, um, having known uh, what it was like to be in the U.S. Um, he kind of put his arm around me and was always asking how I was doing and these things, which, as many people know, is probably not common um, necessarily within Japanese culture because we're a lot more reserved. And so for him to reach out the way he did, it was super instrumental. Um, but I do think that a lot of those things and embracing the culture and having guys like Kenji around and a support staff like we did, the Tigers did a good job of supporting us, that it certainly provided us a, 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 a place to be able to succeed. So do you want to talk a little bit about breaking Ichiro's record? Yeah, so just real quick, I mean, there's so many things that flood your mind when you, when you think back on that moment. Um, I think one of the biggest things was is that, like, for so long, I had, look, at the end of the day, as individuals, we all want to be successful. There's no denying that. Um, but with that being said, I think one of the ways that an athlete can get outside of, their, outside of themselves 
um, is one of the ways they can perform at a higher level because instead of worrying about like me having to get a particular hit, I'm more focused on competing with the pitcher, finding a way to move runners, get guys in, just play the game of baseball. And so what I did notice around that Ichiro time was like the week or two leading into it was the press had started following, asking questions constantly. Are you going to break this record? And I started feeling a little uncomfortable because all of a sudden now it was about what I was doing in some way rather than what, my, what I was doing for my team. And I felt this sense of like, if I didn't accomplish this as I got closer and closer, that somehow I would have failed. And so the media in Japan is a, is a and we may have a chance to talk about that a little bit more later, but I think once you get off the plane, you recognize the media is a big deal. You get off the plane and then also, and how they cover their teams on a day-to-day -day basis, in addition to how that was going with Ichiro. Um, playing in Chicago, there is a lot of media. You have a lot of presence. So I played at Wrigley Field. I did have some element of being exposed to it. But as much as you get the exposure, Japan and the media is, is, is almost on another level. So I think I had this sense of having to accomplish this. And last thing, just really quickly, is that the moment that I actually did it, I was in, in Jingu playing against the Yukal Swallows. And I remember getting up with bases loaded. It was late in the year. And we're trying to you know, make a push at the end uh, in a pennant race with the bases loaded in less than two outs. And I remember the guy on the mound left-handed with a good changeup. And I told myself, I was like, you know what? At this moment, just, just knock this guy in from third. Don't do anything more than knock the guy in from third. Use the middle of the field. And all of a sudden, when I took it off of me having to get this hit and I focused on just getting my guy in, then all of a sudden, the hit came. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to welcome our panelists today and all our viewers out there. And then I'd like to follow up with a question for Jim Small. Uh, Jim, we just heard about the player's perspective, but can you talk a little bit about uh, the cultural differences between Major League Baseball and Japan Baseball from the business perspective. Absolutely. So <clears throat> like Matt, I, I, I do want to start by thanking um, USJC. We, we've been a member for a number of years and really proud of that and proud to support USJC, the work they do and Japan House and all the sponsors that made this possible. It, I also, I, I love what Matt said about embracing the culture. And, you know, I brought my family there when um, my kids were seven, five and two. And um, my wife was, you know, I said, hey, how'd you like to move to Japan for two years? And she was like, great, let's go. Uh, and it turned into this uh, wonderful odyssey of 16 years. And uh, I think, you know, my kids and sometimes my wife and I feel sometimes more Japanese than we do American. But um, on, on the business side, you know, it, it's, um, I'd say now the, the difference uh, between Major League Baseball and NPB is much, much smaller than it was when I got there. Um, you know, we moved there in 2003 and the, the, <clears throat> the atmosphere in the ballpark um, was all fan generated, right? So it owned on everything that people love about Japanese baseball was there, but it was generated by the fans, not by the club. And I think, you know, you can make the point that um, baseball in Japan uh, thrived despite the marketing, not because of the marketing. Um, the fans were almost an afterthought. There was a famous um, incident that came out in the newspaper where the president of a Pacific League team, when asked about the fans, said the fans are like carp, they'll eat what we feed them. And that was the mindset. Um, it, but, but it slowly changed. And I, I think hopefully we had a little to do with that. I think we, um, you know, opened up um, our business um, to, to, to anyone that wanted to come see it uh, from a club standpoint, from the NPB standpoint, you know, in a major league baseball, we're not in the business of baseball. We're in the business of entertainment. And we have this three hour window that we can entertain you and we control everything in the fan experience, right? Everything except the score of the game and, and the weather, you know, how we, and actually, we have some dome stadiums. So I guess in those places, we do control the weather. Um, but, but, you know, everything in that fan experience, how easy it is to buy a ticket, where that seat is, what the entertainment is, what the food is, all of that we control. So we better give you what you want, because if we do, you'll come back. I think you're seeing a lot more of that now in, in Japanese baseball. Um, you go to, to the game up, you know, to a game up in Sendai. Um, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff going on around that ballpark <clears throat> that's club generated, right? The Ondan's still there, the, 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 the amazing sounds and sights of, of a Japanese ballpark are still there, that fan generated stuff. But the, the, having the club kind of understand that, you know, it, it, in a place where Kaksama Akami, you know, that where, the, where, the, where the, the customer is, is God, you know, we say the customer is king in America, in Japan, customer is God. I think, 
a lot of Japanese teams are finally realizing that in half of the past four or five years. So I think that it's it's a much closer, um, uh, it, we're much closer than we were before. I, I do want to say though, that one of my, my uh, pet peeves, and I've said this to any, anybody that will listen, is this idea of, of still naming your teams after companies is, is tough for, for me and for a lot of my Japanese baseball friends to, to, you know, friends to understand, right? So, it, it, you know, people are proud. It doesn't matter where you're from, right? You're, you're proud of where you're from. So if you're from Fukuoka or from Sapporo or from Nagoya, that, that's your home. And so you want to see that on your uniform. Nobody gets excited about working for, you know, su supporting a, a, a drink company. I won't, won't name a particular one. Um, and, and what happens is there's a disincentive and for the club to try to earn revenue, right? Because if they lose money, they can deduct that as an advertising cost because the, 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 the team is named after the, the, um, you know, the, the, the parent company. <clears throat> so there's a disincentive to focus on the fans and give the fans what they want. So I would encourage them to do that. I know that the, the, the fighters have, have gone a lot more with Hokkaido, which I think is great. I know the Giants have used Tokyo a lot. I would just encourage them to keep going and doing that. Quick follow-up question, Jim. Uh, with this disincentive to, to earn this extra money, um, do you think we'll see the Japanese teams now or eventually reaching out to the United States to develop a market here for for um, fan memorabilia, for, for TV rights, whatever. I, you know what, they should. And we, we've talked to them about that for a lot of years. Um, you know, that, that Giants logo is iconic, right? And so I, I don't know about Matt, and I'm, I'm sure you had friends saying, hey, hook me up with some Tiger stuff, right? You know, people wanna get it and it's hard to get it in the United States. I do think a couple things, one is, you know, because of the pandemic this year uh, in April and May, the only baseball on American television uh, was the KBO. And so the KBO is starting to get a little bit of following here. And so I think the NPB is looking at that. And, and I do think that they're going to move forward on it. Look, it's the inverse relationship. We It works perfectly for us because a Yankees the Sox game is on at nine in the morning in Tokyo. You can watch MLB games during the day and watch NPB games at night. It's the inverse, right? So a, a Giants game is going to come on in the morning. Um, and, and if you're a hardcore baseball fan, particularly on a Saturday or Sunday, you're going to watch it. So I, I encourage them to do it. We'll work with them on helping them on that because uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Okay, so let's see. Next, we want to go to Don. How did these cultural attitudes change after Nomo came to the major leagues? And the, did the attitudes of the Japanese players you represent also change over time? Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I hope I can contribute something today. I'm looking forward to listening to everybody's opinion and thoughts. And uh, so far, it's been very interesting. The attitudes of players, uh, let me start by saying the game itself in Japan has changed with the influence of a lot of the players going to the United States and many players coming over from the United States, like Matt, uh, coming in and introducing a lot of the American style baseball. Today, we see more of uh, pitchers in Japanese professional baseball, and even starting to see some in uh, amateur baseball, starters, relievers, and closer type of a game that, that never had, uh, I would say, pre Hidel Nomo era. However, I must say the attitudes of the players have not changed very much. Uh, and uh, the reason I say that is because of the system they have in the core roots of baseball in Japan, the amateur, the high school, the junior high school, the colleges. I call it the communist society of baseball. They still slave the kids to play baseball and take orders by the authoritarian of the baseball coaches, the, the school, the, the head coaches, and they're reeled into playing to the next level. So until they sign professionally, they don't realize what kind of system they are currently in. By big surprise, a lot of them finally figures out that they can't leave their current contract and come to the United States as easily and uh, there is 
to 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 the state. There isn't a system that the players can leave unless they get a permission from the club. So the mentality uh, of the players itself hasn't really changed that much um, from back in 1995, unfortunately. Dwayne, I have a question for you. Um, you founded the Hawaii Winter Baseball League, where you had players from Korea and the United States and Japan on the same field. So what was it like uh, to have players from three different cultures all in the same time? And what kind of problems did you run into? And how did you deal with that? So, Rob, thanks for the question. Do, do you have five hours for me to answer that question? <laughs> A little shorter than that. <laughs> so, so like the other guests, panelists, thank you for uh, putting this panel together. It was uh, actually for me, it was good to see some old friends like Don Lomura and Jim Small. You guys look different from 25 years ago. And, and actually, you know, Don, you know, w w as you're speaking, you, you made me smile because you know, the Marvin Miller in you has not gone away. Uh, you know, so, so for the listeners, Don Lomura has been, has actually, he's transformed, in my eyes, has really transformed Japanese baseball. And Jim Small, I always have fun being with you and the last time we were, we were together in Japan, we're having a meal at a restaurant. I, I think it was to talk about the All-Star game. And this waitress came to see us. And of course, I'm supposed to be an Asian. So she looked at me to speak in Japanese and asking for our order. And I asked Jim, so um, looking, looking at the menu, can you read kanji? He said, no, I can't. So he said, just order by the picture. So I, we, he ordered. By the picture, I said, I want this. And I said, can you order for me too? And actually, you, you spoke in Japanese. He said, Ipon, Ipon, whatever, two meals. So thank you. Now, I'm not sure you got what you wanted. You might have gotten something <laughs> very different with my Japanese. And and, and Matt, in our, our pre-conference, uh, good to meet you and hope to get to know you better. And you know, in, in our paths, you play the game. I wish I had your kind of talent. I had to be on the other side. So I'm sure we've crossed paths between Japan and the US. I, I got a, a love for the game because growing up in a, a in a plantation camp on the Big Island of Hawaii, that was the only game that we played. There was no organized basketball or soccer. All we had was baseball. Our imagination had to actually carry us in the game because we had to listen to the game on the radio. So I, I hate to say that, yeah, I'm a part owner of the Giants, but I grew up a Dodger fan because that's the game that we could hear every day. But when I had a chance to pick up the pieces of, of, of a previous attempt to, to start a, a winter league in Hawaii. I, I jumped at the chance for that reason, for my love of the game. But in that process, I, I learned that it wasn't easy, number one. And number two, that I felt, that I saw that baseball and Hawaii could be a bridge for the world and that its coaches and players could be ambassadors. I, I learned a lot in that process. I learned in, in, in putting the league together back in 1992, that Major League Baseball at, at that time was uh, a lot more rigid and centralized. It probably is the same way today. And in, in contrast to Japanese baseball, which was more um, flexible and decentralized. And so what really what that mean, meant for me in organizing the league was that I had to go and visit every uh, Japanese ball club in Japan. and. So when I went, when I first got here, they said, oh no, you can't just come once. You gotta go, you gotta come many times like Peter O'Malley. They said, you gotta follow Peter O'Malley. You'll be here like four times a year. So I'm okay, I, I, I'll do my best. And so I had to go in Aisatsu, you know, to, to, uh, to get to know the front office, to know the owners. And, and thank goodness, my, my really good friend, Wally Yonomini held my hand throughout the whole journey and, and, and help to open doors and, and help uh, the teams welcome me. But when, but when we started the league, um, it was a mixture of, as Eureka said, major league players, mine, uh, uh, prospects, young uh, major league players from, from Japan, Korea. And actually we had some, some players from Taiwan. We had two teams uh, on Oahu and Maui. We kept them all MLB players, the big island of Hawaii in Hilo and on Kauai 
we, we mixed the teams. The Kauai team had the Koreans, the Taiwanese, and, and one major league club, was a, which, which was the Pittsburgh Pirates. And then the first practice, so the, the Taiwanese came with, sent three players, they all were injured. So of course it was a miscommunication. And so that changed. But in the first practice, the, the Koreans, they, want, they didn't want to practice with everybody else. They wanted to practice on their own. And, and the, the coach, Trent Jewett, had a had difficult time bringing everybody together. So I had to get on the field and, and ask them, can you, you're a team, you, it's not Korea against US or Korea against Taiwan, it's and Korea against Japan, it's Korea, one team representing Kauai. Actually, those that those differences in culture actually brought the teams closer together to, to such an extent that halfway through the season, both the Honolulu team and the Kauai, the Maui team, we had, which, which had only MLB players in them, would ask, can we be like them? What that meaning? They want. They actually wanted the mixture of cultures that that the Hilo team and Kauai team had, because they saw how much fun the players had with each other. Number one, but number two, interestingly enough, the players, the teams performed better, and so I, I, I my guess was that. With, with, with the extra effort they had to make in, in, in bridging cultures and, and, and communicating with each other, it, it elevated their, their level of play. Just one last tidbit. So the first game um, that was played on Kauai was the Kauai Emeralds and Maui Stingrays. And I was talking with two farm directors. I can't, it was so long ago, I can't remember their names. And then I, another farm director came running up to us, this was during batting practice, and say, guys, you got to look at this Japanese player. This guy is absolutely amazing. So we ran down to the field, and we, we saw this, this guy just hitting bombs consistently over the, the right field fence beyond the warehouse, and people in Kauai were in awe because they never saw anybody hit the ball that far. And uh, that young man was Ichiro. People who have seen him take batting practice before games would see that same amazing ability um, to hit the ball consistently over the right field fence. Thanks so much, Dwayne. You know, I think we're going to have to write a book together pretty soon. Rob's next project. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Next, we'd like to have take a look at how some of these differences affected your lives in preparation, surprises, personal strategies, possible cultural misunderstandings. We've already had a few of those, but um, Jim, can we start with you? I know you lived in Japan for quite a long time and you must have some good stories for us. Or... I do, I have a lot of them. Um, you know, I don't know where to start. Early on, um, I think I was pretty prepared. I traveled to Japan a lot. I didn't speak any Japanese, but I, I traveled there a lot. So, you know, the, the, from a business perspective, I, you know, I was, I was pretty prepared. I still relied on a lot of people like Don and Wayne Grisick and, and Marty Keener and Bob Whiting and, and Don used to come into my office in, in uh, Imperial Tower. And I was just like, okay, I need a sanity check here. You know, what is this all about? But most of the, most of the things where I really got to learn about the cultural aspect of Japanese baseball came really because of my kids, because, because both kids played on a non team uh, in Minato Ku. As a matter of fact, Andrew Small was a big Matt Merton fan because he was, I told Matt this story the other day, because he was um, a gaijin kid on his team. And he goes, I'm kind of like Matt Merton without the red hair. And so I, I got to see so many cool things through their eyes and the respect for the game and things like that. There's there's a couple stories that stand out. One is um, my son, John, um, was playing right field. And and this is early in his, his career. He's probably, you know, nine or 10 years old. And, you know, in Japan, when you say, come here, you do this, right? Well, he, he was, the, the Kanto could went in would come in because he was playing too deep in right field and he's doing this. My kid looks at him and like, and starts backing up, right? Because in America, you're like, get out, move back. And John's moving farther back and the Kanto is like screaming at him. And so I had to just yell, John, move in. And luckily he could hear me. I also would tell him sometimes he'd miss a sign and I'd tell him to steal second. It was great because a lot of people didn't speak English and the other teams. 
Um, so there are things like that, but you know, the, the story that really stands out to me, and it's not a, it's not a cultural misunderstanding. It's, it's, um, it, it just really uh, underscores what Japanese baseball is. And that was different Kantoko on the team. I was a, the assistant coach or one of the coaches on the team. <clears throat> and I got an email saying that the Kantoko was in the hospital with some, you know, fairly serious liver uh, challenges and it wouldn't be a practice. And so I go to practice on a Saturday morning, eight o'clock, and who do I see there? And, and, and again, I get there early because you have to get practices at eight, you have to be there at 730. Uh, and so I get there and who's already there but the Kantoku. And I look at him and he has a uh, IV bag in his back pocket and that goes into his arm, right? And he had snuck out of the hospital, got in a taxi, came over to run the practice, finished the practice eight hours on Saturday um, and went back, snuck back into the hospital. And he didn't, he didn't have a kid on the team, right? In, in America, you could say, well, you know, you would do that for your kid. No, his kids were grown. They had already passed. He did that for my kid. And he did it for every other kid on that team. And I've worked in baseball for 38 years. That is my most humbling moment. Because if somebody cares enough about the game to sneak out of a hospital to help my kid, it's pretty special. So, so those are some of the stories I, you know, I, I could, I, you know, there are thousands more, but those are the ones that come to mind. Wow, that's amazing. Thanks, Jim. So Matt, after you signed to go over to Hanchin and uh, you told your family, what did you personally and what did you do with your family to prepare for the trip? And I don't mean like pack, I mean, culturally, did you read books? Did you study the language? Um, you must have had ideas of what Japan was like in your mind. And then once you got there, what went wrong? Yeah, for sure. So. Uh... One of the things I did right off the bat was I started leaning into some families that I knew. Uh, the Thompson family, uh, had he had worked for IBM um, and had spent five years in Tokyo. Um, he was with Chick-fil-A and we had some mutual friends. And so I started leaning into people like that to, to try to gain a better understanding of what the, I was about to get into. Uh, really simply, you got to have WA, read that. Uh, Mr. Baseball, I watched that. And then my agent, uh, Keith Miller, he told me, you better be ready to play because you think you're going to go over there and it's going to be somehow easier. He goes, it's not going to be. So my preparation as an athlete certainly continued to, to maintain its course. Uh, those were the three major things. Outside of that, it was like the family stuff that you would anticipate. Um, we made phone calls to players who had been over there in the past and tried to get a better understanding of what, hey, what do we need? We have young kids. My wife's about to have a baby over there. Like, what should we bring um, that maybe we we don't we wouldn't think of. And what was funny is that over the years, so like the first year you go over, you come over with like a survival kit of everything from America that maybe you thought you would need. And what you come to recognize over the years is that in all reality, Japan offers all of those things. You just have to figure out how to how to get it off the shelf and and how to how to navigate those waters. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of things like many athletes that they do to prepare to go over there. Great, thank you. So Dwayne. In your experiences with Hawaii winter baseball or with the San Francisco Giants, do you recall any humorous or surprising stories? I, I, I can ask, like Neil, Matt, when, when in your experience in in um, in Japan, that that kind of hit home because I, I think that no matter how good you are, and no matter what your physical talents are, it's it's not easy for foreign players to succeed in Japan. And because you need to easily adapt to and embrace the Japanese culture, as you had mentioned. And so, you know, during, as I mentioned, that I, I had to go and make aisatsu with all the different ball clubs many times over. And once I, I remember going into Fukuoka, Daie Hawks back, it was Daie Hawks back then. And I, I saw an American player, so I went up to him as he was eating and I asked him, so, so how are things going? And he had, he was holding his two chopstick, one in each hand and trying to eat the noodles. And he's saying, Oh, it's, it's great. I love this place. I, I, I thought to myself, man, this guy isn't going to last too long in Japan. So Matt, I don't know if they gave you a lot, they're kind enough to give you a fork, but in this particular case, this guy said there was nothing else for him to use except for chopsticks. But, in Hawaii winter baseball, it was a ritual for the Maui team. During the first, prior to the first game, they'd select a Japanese player who'd come up to me and, and speak to me in English. 
of course, the, the, his vocabulary would be the vocabulary that he learned from his teammates. Every single time this Japanese player would come up to me and, and say, I know what I'm saying is not politically correct. Of course, he didn't use the word political, but he said, I know I'm not, I'm not correct. But of course, he'd greet me with all these swear words, right? one swear word after another. And so it, 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 it was part of the fun of um, that whole league. But I want to finish with, with, with one um, more serious thing. And it was uh, the experiences I had with my really good friend, Wally Yonamini. So in my many visits with him and in our travels together, I saw things and I experienced things with him that still today would amaze me. And so once we were in a cab going from Marunouchi back to Akasaka and as, a, as the cab was, I remember this really clearly, as the cab was passing Hibiya, cab driver just stopped, just screeched on his brake and just stopped. And he looked over and he said, because Wally and I were speaking, well, we're, we speak pidgin, pidgin English to each other. <laughs> it was, that, that was what our, our way of communicating. So like the guy turned around and said, asked, are, are you Wally Yonomine? And Wally said, yes. And he said, you know, my life was so difficult for the past few months. And now that you wrote, you've wrote, written in my cab, I know the rest of my life is going to be okay. And so I, I, I told Wally, man, I like hanging around with you. Maybe some of that would end up uh, um, uh, helping me. And he said, and then with that, he said, well, I, I hope, I, I wonder if he's going to let us ride the cab for free. And I'll let you think about whether he let us ride for free or not. But we, we all need heroes. And I think the game of baseball has allowed that to be and allow children and adults alike to dream and, and to have hope for our future. And I feel like probably the rest of the panel is so, so um, proud and, and privileged to have been involved with the game. Thank you, Dwayne. Yep. So Don, you of course are bilingual, you're bicultural, and as an agent, you deal with managements and players from both Japan and the US. So can you talk a little bit about the strategies you use? When do you put on your Japanese hat? When do you put on your American hat? When are you Japanese? When are you American as it suits you? It's a very interesting and question. And I, I really starting to understand culturally and biculturally in the, probably the last 10, 15 years. But uh, Duane just mentioned a very important word, uh, aisatsu, which means to go out and greet people. Uh, this is a very important part of the Japanese culture. And there's another word, nemawashi, is um, making necessary arrangements. So it's like uh, backdoor handling, meeting people, preparing for the moment of negotiations. And in Japan, for my experience, yes doesn't necessarily mean yes. And that's been my biggest uh, mistake in, in the early part of my uh, growing up because in Japan, people would say yes. And then from my Western um, studies, yes means yes, we have agreed to something, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have agreed. It means yes, I understand your question, but that doesn't equate to doing business. And I'm sure Jim has gone through all that as well. Uh, so those are things that uh, really uh, threw a curveball at me. So today I kind of, in Japan, I do business as a Japanese with a little Western flavor. And in the States, I do business as a American with a little Japanese flavor. And I try to mix it up and try to use the best of both worlds to uh, introduce each culture uh, so people can understand and clarify things as we go along. So uh, that's pretty much how I handle the two cultures. Thanks. Thank you. Here we go. On you and I are gonna have to have some conversations later because I know that real. Um, so, but finally, um, we'd like to address the shared love of baseball 
and how this connects our two countries. We wouldn't be having this conversation today if we didn't talk about that. So let's see, we'd like to start with Dwayne and how your work with the San Francisco Giants have connected with Japan through baseball and also reached out to the Japanese American community. So the, the Giants as um, well as just about all the other MF major league clubs all have um, reached out to Japan in an attempt to uh, to develop working agreements and to to work on getting players to play for that team. And in, in this in, in working agreements, it would be like in, the, in shared marketing and sharing um, training ideas and and analytics. But when I became a partner of the Giants back in 1996, Peter McGowan, our managing partner then, reached out to me and asked if I can coach their international director who just a year before um, got added response. He was, a, um, he was in charge of Latin America and he got added on the responsibilities for Japan. So listening to, to Don Nomura uh, also made me smile because um, here, here this guy would say, I've been going to Japan. I went there twice. I did my job and because every place that I went to Everybody said hi. So everybody agreed with everything that I had to say. So I don't have to go back again. So I had to explain to him, as like Don said, that, you know, hi doesn't mean yes. It means uh, I hear you. And so, of course, I, I can't remember the guy's name because I don't think he lasted very long as the international director for, for the Giants. But as Don said, bridging that that language barrier in just in that word high is 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 critical in not only in baseball but even in business. It's, it's the same way in business. So the Giants also reach, reaches out to the com Japanese American community with their Japanese Heritage Night, and we try to we've made a number of attempts to sign uh, Japanese ball players, and and the most recent one was uh, Nori Norichika. And so um, I was asked to introduce him to the, um, the Japanese public in Japantown in San Francisco. And he, he spoke Japanese and had an interpreter, but then he said in English that his, his name, you can just call me Nori. So I said, okay, you are, you mean Siwi, like Siwi. And so we, we all had a laugh and continue to laugh about that. But I think it was just a, a, like an entree for 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 Nori, for Siwi, uh, in, in, into the, the San Francisco community, which has a large Japanese American population, as compared to the, the cities that he was in. He was in Milwaukee and, and, and Kansas City before that. And so it, it's, it, I, I, I hope that his time there even if it was there just a year, was as um, as memorable and fun for him as it was for him to be on our team. But baseball has come a long way, and and um, especially today, um, you know, um, baseball gives us a foundation of hope and for racial and cultural tolerance and collaboration, and something that this world needs today more than ever. Thank you very much, Dwayne, for that. Yeah. Don, I have another question for you. Yes, sir. When we're talking about baseball diplomacy and bringing the countries together through baseball, I feel that one of the most important people who have done that on a big scale was Hideo Nomo. And that's kind of ironic because Nomo, from what I understand, was kind of um, a very quiet guy. He didn't really like to be in the public eye. So can you talk a little bit about what it was like for him to become a kind of a cultural icon of two cultures and how he dealt with that? Well, I think he came in a very adverse moment and turbulence time with baseball in Major League, uh, right after the strike, uh, not understanding much of what's happening, what's going to happen. And leaving Japan was a horrendous thing for him because all the media was attacking him. 
as I look back, maybe it was a good thing because he used that as an energy to do well. But I, I think most importantly, he had many advocate that supported him, including Peter O'Malley, uh, Tommy Lasorda, and, and the people at the Dodgers were wonderful supporting. And a, as he started pitching well, I think uh, the fans turned and really supported him in many ways. So making a transition from Japan to U.S. wasn't as hard because O'Malley family. And I think we chose the right club uh, where we with. So overall, I think he was uh, more relaxed in making adjustment from Japan to the United States. And sometimes today it's, it's a lot tougher because it's more, more of a business. So I would say the transition from Japan to U.S. was not hard because of their family for Hideo. Any place be hard coming from Japan or coming from the United States and making adjustments uh, in living in a different city, country, culture, or changes from where you were, you know, brought up. So, but I think baseball is a tool where people can make adjustments on the cultural thing and learn things through baseball, you know, Japan and the U.S. Well, let's see. Let's go to Matt next. So, Matt, as an American player in Japan. And then getting to bring that back here, how did you experience being there kind of as a cultural ambassador? And I think that your experiences there kind of led you to the nonprofit that you're now working on. Yeah, so I think, I think like uh, some of the, uh, uh, the other guys were kind of explaining, I think that I, I certainly am extremely grateful uh, to the game of baseball and what it has provided not only me, but my family. You know, I, I'll never forget um, sitting at the table, um, having a pregame meal, and whether it was in the United States or it was in Japan, and you start looking around the table and you recognize that there are a lot of different people that don't all look exactly like I look or talk like I do, and yet we're all here sharing this meal together. We're sharing this field together, and, um, you know, that was certainly evident in Japan. Um, when you think that we, we've kind of touched on a little bit, but the nature by which the young athlete uh, engages the game in Japan is distinctly different than how a young athlete engages the game in the United States. And I used to tell myself, here's this little redheaded boy from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And yet there I'm sharing this table in this field with guys who grew up in sometimes in rural parts of Japan um, that again, went about it completely differently. So to watch the game of baseball uh, bring us together whether it was the Latin American players in the United States, or again, you know, I remember as a little boy, listening to these stories is really cool because there's so many things that, that it comes back to my memory. As a little boy watching Hideo Nomo, I think that Hideo Nomo, again, transcended uh, culture because there was this guy that had this unique pitching motion. I remember as a kid, we would all mimic his pitching motion. And just to think of all of these guys that, that went from one country to another, um, Ichiro uh, coming to the United States, I had it said to me that as I was getting closer to breaking his record, that um, there was countless stories uh, about guys um, who were potentially were going to break Tadahara O's home run record and how that was handled. And it was said to me that they felt like during that time period, the game had become more globalized. They had recognized that Ichiro had been given the opportunity to break the record in the United States. And so because he had gone and done that, that they in some ways felt like they weren't going to make it easy, but that they needed to provide that same opportunity to the American athlete within Japan. So what we see is this cultural maybe divide that we once had, but the game of baseball continued to grow us closer and closer together. And so with that, just really quickly, like when I finished my career in 17, 2018 was the first time I'd come back to Japan. And we came back to Japan out of a heart of gratitude for all that the country had provided, not only me, but my family. And we recognized that. We didn't want to come back with any like agenda outside of just caring for the people. By coming back and hosting clinics and doing very charitable events or whatever it was, uh, we started to get some momentum. And it was kind of like grassroots. And we started having conversations about like, how can we make this more sustainable? 
and that's kind of what you're touching on. We, we, we've kind of tried to figure out like, and there's no, there's probably no easy way. Um, but I love the game. I love, I love the country of Japan. It provided us amazing experiences. And so part of what we're trying to do is we are trying to um, help support current athletes in Japan, um, provide a network for them um, by which they can kind of have an understanding of what to expect when they go over, uh, empowering them to become more engaged within their own communities within Japan, and uh, even get to the place where potentially we start bringing some uh, major league athletes to Japan together to host clinics that we have been doing in the past. So there's, there's a lot of pieces to this, and we don't know exactly where it's going, but we certainly, we just recently within the last few weeks, I was having some conversations with some athletes that were finishing up their season at the time there in Japan. So we don't know where it's going. We have a heart for the game. We have a heart for both countries. And ultimately, we are extremely grateful. And so it continues to bring us together. That's wonderful. So, Jim, can you talk a little bit about the Major League Tours of Japan and how they have brought uh, Japan and the United States closer together? And then finish up by talking about your cultural expectations of the World Baseball Classic. Could it bring about world peace? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. The um, you know, I think the other guys in the panel probably have heard this before. I'm sure a lot of the, a lot of the people who've logged on have heard this. But um, you know, this this phrase, whether it's true or not, depending on you know, the industry where you are. But this phrase that you know, the pe in Japan, the penalty for taking a risk and being wrong is worse than the reward for taking a risk and being right. Right. So we've I don't know if you've heard that before. I heard it a lot and. I think that extended to baseball. I mean, I never never played on the field the way Matt did or the way Don did, uh, but but I think it extended into baseball. And I, and I would see that you know we'd go over in Nichibayaku in the All Star Series and we'd win every game. We'd kick their butts. And um, and, and I had a, I heard a coach say to me once that one of our coaches, a major league coach, that geez, this game game goes really fast for him, right? And and a good baseball player game goes slowly. You know, they, they know where the ball is going to go. If the ball sits in, they know what they're going to do. Other people told me it wasn't a talent issue. It, it just, they seemed scared. They seemed uh, afraid and they seemed like they were prepared to lose to us. Um, and then Ichiro happened, right? And, and, and Ichiro kind of changed Japanese baseball forever. And, 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 and absolutely Hideo had, had, a, had a role in that too. But when Ichiro came over, you know, he was fearless. He was willing to take risks. He didn't care, right? And he changed the clubhouse culture. And you saw that with the WBC in, in 2006, right? He, that was his clubhouse. And, you know, he said some stuff in the paper about the Koreans, which, which upset the Koreans and just very un-Japanese things, right? But he, he galvanized that clubhouse. And so coming out of that, they won the World Baseball Classic in 2006. We had a Nichibayaku that fall. I don't think things had caught on yet, we, but we had a great team that went over. It was Ryan Howard, Chase Utley, and Joe Maurer, and Jose Reyes, and these guys, and we won all the games. But they came back, and Ichiro came back with that 2009 WBC team that won. And that team had, I think, 11 or 12 players, including everyone that we've talked about today, Nori, Aoki, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, Jojima, and a bunch of those guys. And they, they won the WBC. And then after that, that changed everything for us on the Nichibayaki side. We used to be able to go over and have a couple workouts in LA and then go over and win all the games. And that changed. In 2004, we got beat. In 2016, or 2014, we got beat. 2016, we got beat. 2014, we got beat. You know, we got, a, we got no hit in, at the Tokyo Dome, right? So as the marketer of, of Major League Baseball in Asia, it's like, yeah, it was a little hard to market that, you know, we, we, we sent over our all-star team and we got no hit uh, and, and Robbie Cano was on that team and Altuve and guys like that. So I think you can, you can clearly draw this analogy to me, to what each row meant um, and, and into that clubhouse and what that's meant to international baseball. So having Japan win the first two WBCs, really kind of sent a message to everyone else that we got to go, you know, we got to get better. And so and unfortunately for the tournament, um, you know, the Dominican Republic won um, in 2013 and the United States won in 2017. So I think everyone's had to up their game. And I think you can bring that back to WBC. And, and, and that's, that's why I'm 
uh, and the Japan's um, you know performance in the WBC. So you know I think the World Baseball Classic is um, you know we've got some some things we're working on that I think everyone's going to be you know excited to hear. We're going to announce something probably hopefully in the next six months or so. We have a lot of we believe in the future of that tournament, um, and we believe that Japan has a major major role in that tournament. So Jim, when is the next WBC? Well, we haven't announced it yet. Unfortunately, it was supposed to be 2021. It was supposed, and, and because of COVID, we've had to push back, but we're going to announce it soon. We, we need to, you know, there, an event like this, you have a lot of contracts and, negoti- and, and uh, details you have to work through. We've just about worked those through, but I think you'll see us announce something in the next six months. But there will be one, I guarantee you. There will be multiples. Thanks, Jim. So we're running short on time now, but we have a chance to take a few questions. And there's a lot of great questions in the uh, bullpen here. Um, I'll just kind of pick a couple and maybe we'll get through them. First one's really for Don. What are the primary motivations for uh, Japanese players coming to Major League Baseball right now? Is it monetary or is it the idea to prove yourself? Is it cultural? What are your views on that? I think it's uh, generally both, uh, depending on the individual. Um, as you know, athletes are very competitive and they would like to challenge to be in the best area. Uh, Major League Baseball has the best level of high skilled baseball players. Uh, monetary issues is also important because baseball players' career are very short. Uh, so I think it's really both, but um, I, I think if you weigh it on, on a scale, I think it's the competitiveness that they want to come out here to the United States and play. Thanks. Eureka, you want to take the next question? Um, sure. Okay. So what is the future of young, of young players' development in Japan and the U.S.? And given the effects of COVID-19 and minor league baseball and how it's kind of shrunk back what do you think about the future of young players in japan and in the u.s let's see that Jim. 10 in particular or? uh jim you want to handle that for should have remained mute um <laughs> no the uh look i think that uh, i'll speak on, on the on the u.s side and some of the changes in the minor leagues uh, you know I, I i think that you know there will be obviously there will be changes into the minor league system i think that they're going to benefit um, players, I think you're going to see more players going to college in the United States as opposed to going into the traditional system. And I think that's positive. I think that helps the athlete mature more. Um, you know, personally, I, I, I see some of the challenges that we have, particularly in bringing international players. You know, the player signs, we have, a, we have a, a, three academies in China. The kid signs at 18 years old. He's not physically ready and he's, he's a lot of more emotionally ready, you know, to, to be able to go into the minor leagues in the United States. So, I think that's really positive. Um, I'll defer to, to, to Don and Matt about the Japan side of things. Yeah, so I, I think Don kind of touched on it a little bit already. Um, I, I think that from a player's perspective, um, and then just having a few years, the last few years to work in uh, operations with the Cubs, I, what you start to recognize is when I came back from Japan to the United States, the conversation uh, around the game had changed significantly uh, in that technology has begun to to drive the development process for United States athletes. So we are at at an era by which greatest uh, output, whether it is exit velocities off a bat or velocity on the mound, uh, is starting to drive the conversation. Again, it's been five years since I was last there as an athlete in Japan, but Japan was not there yet. I know that the track man systems were starting to be installed in the stadiums um, and so forth and so on. But going back to what Don touched on, Um, There was much more of a militaristic type style to the development of the athlete within Japan um, to the point where, um, and and learning from one another, um, I certainly think the United States could find a way to become uh, more willing to be a part of a group, uh, being willing to check one's own ego, even though we all have them at the door and being a part of a whole um, and maybe not so individualistic. I think from the Japanese side and the development aspect of it, um, I think that they could certainly uh, find a way to become um, more willing to step outside of the box. I mean, really quickly, one example is when we would warm up and they'd give us a chance to do our own program. Most of the guys would just look at each other and not know what to do and have to follow along and how they prepared themselves for a game. Um, and lastly, 
Um, I remember standing in Coach Dan Stadium in the outfield. And when I was out there, I said, you know what? I, it's starting to dawn on me. The high school tournament in Koshien is like the, is kind of held in this holy grail. And so these, especially starting pitchers in, the, uh, in this Koshien tournament and everything, but the nature by which these guys develop themselves uh, at a young age and then into high school. And I started looking around the professional field, their interactions with their managers and their coaches was significantly different than our interactions with our managers and our coaches to the point where it almost felt like a glorified high school team that was getting paid money to do it. So kind of the way that they engaged was much more subservient to what they were told to do. Whereas the American athlete takes a lot more uh, of that onus on themselves to prepare themselves for the game. So I think in the development way, I think that what you'll probably end up seeing is that we've become so technologically based that it's all about the one player's uh, ability to get a certain output not necessarily moving a runner or getting a guy in from third, but how can I hit the ball at a certain launch with a certain exit velocity? So it's become more individualized, even in how we do our um, showcases and how we get players prepared to en enter into professional baseball. From the Japanese side, I would assume, and I can't speak to it, but I would assume in time, you will start to see some of those things trickle into Japanese baseball. But knowing the culture, the little bit that I do, I don't know that you're ever going to get to where the United States is. So I think there's always going to be a little bit more of an element of repetition and militaristic style and how we develop compared to the United States being more individualized. Thank you, Matt. Sorry, sorry I got going. <laughs> no, sorry. that's okay. Yeah. So I, I wish we had more time because there's a lot of great questions in there, but I think we're going to have to wrap this up. I just want to throw out a couple little things. One is that 2022 will be the 150th anniversary of US-Japan relations through baseball. So I think um, all of us on the panel and all of you out there should keep that in mind. Um, also, this year has been a big year in that um, we've seen the first Hapa Japanese American manager win a World Series because Dave Roberts is half Japanese American. And then we've also seen the first Asian American woman, it's probably a bigger deal that she's the first woman, uh, become a GM of a major league team. So congratulations, Dave Roberts and Kim Ang. So I just wanted to throw that in there as a tidbit. But I want to say thank you to Japan House LA and to USJC. And I'm going to hand this back over to Yuko. And uh, thanks for participating. Wow, thank you so much. What a fascinating round of discussions that you had. I was feeling so privileged to have been able to hear your inside personal stories. And I was also checking the, the chat box and there were um, so many comments, excitement and down there. So I, I know that all the viewers were having great time listening to all of you. I, I hope that um, you would start thinking about writing a book or co-author uh, a book because it's, uh, it's something that can be shared with uh, many, many others. But uh, thank you uh, for excellent, uh, excellent moderation, Yuriko and uh, Rob. And um, it's been a, a, such a high honor for us to be able to hear uh, such great distinguished speakers, Dwayne, Don, Matt, and Jim, thank you so much. I mean, also, of course, it's a befitting theme because we're going to have Tokyo um, Olympics and Paralympic day Games next year in the summer and baseball, of course, would be an official sport. So we're looking forward to that as well. Earlier in the program, you saw the trailer of Eureka's fascinating documentary, Diamond Diplomacy. We all looking so much forward to seeing the entire film when it's completed. It entails a lot of work and um, and resources to make an independent film of this size and scope. Eureka's goal is to create a vibrant network of engaged individuals, organizations, and companies interested in Japan, cross-cultural exchange, international baseball and diplomacy in history. I hope you will visit her website, diamonddiplomacy.com to learn more and support her project. So thank you so much.